Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Today I want to let you know about something that's going on on our YouTube channel. And that is throughout the month of January, I'm experimenting with posting compilations of podcast episodes. So each YouTube video will have a week's worth of podcast episodes from our first season in 2009. So it's an opportunity to experience multiple detective programs on a single video. We are also having each episode be a premiere on YouTube, which means that the video starts playing live. You can listen, slash watch, and post comments and take part in chat while you enjoy the Uh, video uh, compilation playing. The premiere, every Tuesday in the month of January at 3 p.m. Mountain, that's 5 Eastern, and then once the premiere is over, you can enjoy the entire video compilation. should be sometime after 6 p.m., Uh, Mountain Time, 8 p.m. Eastern. We're trying this out on YouTube in hopes that it will draw new people to the channel and help out with the YouTube algorithm, as well as giving people a way to listen to our older episodes on YouTube. While on our podcast feed, uh, episodes, I think, tend to get a lot more play months after they were posted. With YouTube, it feels like you've got maybe a four to six week period where episodes will get views and then it will disappear off the face of the earth. So if you're interested, check it out, youtube.greatdetectives.net. We're going to continue to do this throughout the month of January, and then we'll consider the whole thing uh, once we have a few weeks worth of data and understanding how people are listening. So again, check that out, youtube.greatdetectives.net, Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, if you want to be on live with the chat, and otherwise should be available uh, by 8 p.m. Eastern Time most uh, days. Well, now it's time to get into this week's Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Serial. I actually recorded myself saying, as always, but then I remembered that this week is going to be a little bit different because we've got a six-parter. So we will be playing the first three episodes of this serial... Today, then we will play the final three episodes of this serial on Friday. Now, if you are minded to listen to all six episodes together, then go ahead and pause the podcast now, then come back on Friday and listen to the whole thing in one block. But now we're going to bring you the first three episodes, which are labeled not one, two, and three, as you might expect, but one, one A, and two. So we're going to be playing episodes one, one A, and two of the Cranesburg matter from August 24th, 27th, and 28th of 1956. Let's go ahead and take a listen. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Bob Lauder, Johnny. Trite State Guarantee. Hiya, Bob. Been a long time. Uh, I wish it were a longer time. Uh, Nothing personal in that, is there? No, no, just bad temper. I'm on the prod, Johnny. We had a pearl necklace swipe, and it's got me irritated. 
Does the same thing to an oyster, the way I hear. Yeah, but in reverse. If an oyster gets irritated, he makes a pearl. I lose a pearl, I get irritated. <laughs> right now, I'm irritated 38 pearls worth. Say it, money. 20,000 clams. Ever hear of Smiley Prowl? Smiley Prowl. Oh, sure. Small-time jewel thief. Couple of raps. Haven't heard of him lately, though. Well, you're here now. He phoned us from Ohio an hour ago. Says he's got the necklace and wants to talk a deal. Who's your client? girl named Melba Crane, a real snooty tooty the way I get it. Owns a town or something. Anyhow, it's named after her family, Cranesburg, Ohio. Well, if I can find it on the map, I'll see about a plane reservation. Don't bother, Johnny. You already got one. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Tri-State Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Cranesburg matter. Item one, $105.35, incidentals in Hartford and transportation to Cranesburg, Ohio. I checked into the hotel, the Crane Hotel, incidentally, and per instructions, waited for contact by one Smiley Prell jewel thief. That Crane name was beginning to run out of my ears, so for the moment at least, I postponed calling on the family itself. As it happened, though, the family came to me, or at any rate, one of them did. Come in. My name is Phineas Crane, Mr. Dollar. Uh, may I... Oh, sure, sure. Come on in, Mr. Crane. Thank you, sir. You're related to Miss Melba Crane? Melba is my niece. And the necklace belonged to her? That is correct. It was her own personal property, not a part of any family holding. Oh, I see. Well, sit down, won't you, Mr. Crane? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Just who <laughs> constitutes the uh, family you mentioned? Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Dollar, only Melba and myself now. We're the last remaining survivors. Uh, oh, now I see you're unpacking, sir. But you just go right ahead and forgive my intrusion. Well, yeah, you did catch me a little by surprise. I just got in town a few minutes ago, and I wasn't expecting visitors. Uh, Mr. Lauder of the insurance company wired that you were coming, and I was waiting here at the hotel. Oh? I understand the thief has approached you. Well, no, not me personally, no. He phoned the main office in Hartford and talked to Lauder. I see. I'll probably hear from him sometime this afternoon. Uh -huh. Now, you say he, Mr. Dollar. Are you certain the call was from a man? Lauder was certain. Do you have some reason to doubt it? Oh, no, oh, no, no, not at all. I, I just wondered... The name he gave is a known jewel thief. Several previous convictions. Smiley Prell. Yes, oh, is that, oh. And the call was made from here in Cranesburg. Yeah, that's right. Is that, well, that's very remarkable. Why so? Well, this is quite a small town, as you've no doubt noticed. Now, a stranger would draw attention. It'd be somewhat uh, conspicuous. Oh, not necessarily. Smiley may have come here some time ago to establish himself. You may even have met him, Mr. Crane. Oh, no, oh, no. Oh, no. well, I'm quite sure that I... Oh, it's utterly impossible. Did Lauder wire you a description? Uh, no, no, of course not. Then how can you be so sure? Uh, well, I uh, I just haven't met any strangers in the last few months. Not a one. Oh, I see. Well, I am now at home. Can I, uh, can I order you up something from the bar, Mr. Crane? Uh, the, oh, no, 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 thank you. No, I really have to run on. I only stopped in for a minute. Did you have anything special in mind? Oh, no, 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 nothing at all. I, um... I don't believe you, Mr. Crane. Uh, I beg your pardon, sir? Well, I just don't believe you. you care for a cigarette? C oh, no, 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 thank you. I, I never smoked. Uh, and I, uh, I must say I fail to understand your implication. You understand I... it all right. Mr. Dollar, I'm afraid... Now, what is it, Mr. Crane? I... Is there something phony about the loss of that necklace? Certainly not. Then what's up? I merely came here to offer my help... And Melba's, too, of course. I wanted you to know that we'll be glad to cooperate fully in any action you may choose to take. That's very generous of you. And your niece. My niece? Well, uh, she's a very remarkable girl, Melba is. Oh? Yeah, she's a trifle headstrong at times, of course. Uh, not always inclined to use the best judgment. Uh-huh. How has she shown this lack of judgment, Mr. Crane? Oh. 
there's nothing specific at all, but I, I did want you... Uh, I did want to see you before you talk to her. You understand? <laughs> Let you know kind of what to expect, as you might say. Well, naturally, she's very upset over the loss of her necklace. I imagine. Uh, you don't have any hope, I suppose, of recovering it? Well, as a matter of fact, I have a lot of hope of recovering it. Possibly within 24 hours. Oh, I see. Oh, well, no. Certainly Melba would be very happy to hear that. It was an engagement gift, you understand, uh, from her fiancé, Dean Sellers, his name. Oh, yeah, she was quite broken up when it was stolen. Well, a $20,000 necklace is a pretty fair loss. Now, Mr. Crane... Oh, would it's you... not the intrinsic value at all, Mr. Dowd. No, I suppose not, since that part of it is covered by the insurance. Well, yeah, oh, yes, quite so. But I was referring to the sentimental attachments, you understand. Oh, naturally. And, of course, to the sheer beauty... Oh! It was lovely, Mr. Wright. You've seen the necklace, I suppose. No, but I've got photographs of it. Oh, yes, of course, yes, from the insurance company. Yeah, it's quite an unusual ornament, with each pearl set individually in a platinum mounting. And the whole thing is... Oh, pardon me. Johnny Dollar. This is you-know-who, Mr. Dollar. Is all right to talk? Yeah, go ahead, shoot. All right. You know where the Green Lion Bar is? I'll find it. Well, meet me there, then, in an um, hour and a half. Check. And I won't have it on me, Dollar, so don't go smarty pants on me or you'll be holding the sack. You, you, I just want you and me, you understand? No cops, huh? I've been in this game a long time, Chuck. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I'm counting on, so I'll see you later. That was the thief, I presume? So he says. Well, I've got to be running along now. If there's anything I can do... Well, Mr. you can Dollar, finish what you were yeah. saying about your niece, if you will. Oh, no, no. It was nothing, really. Not at all. I see. Uh, it's just that Melba is a bit too uh, impulsive at times. Oh. <laughs> Headstrong, you know. She's young and she's foolish, but she never means any actual harm by it. I... Um, no, not really, she doesn't. Now, I, I'm sure you understand that, Mr. Dollar. So, a uh, good day, sir. <laughs> Item two, $26 even, deposit and first day's rental on a hired car. I checked on the location of the Green Lion, 15 minutes from the center of town, so there was plenty of time to follow up another angle before I went to meet Smiley Prell. I parked the car in front of the Cranesburg Bank, went inside and presented my credentials and a letter of introduction to Milton Borkley, president. Uh, step inside the office, Mr. Dollar. We have a little privacy at least. Thanks, Mr. Borkley. Uh, have a seat. All right, thanks. Any any recommendation to Bob Lauders is good enough for me. He handled a lot of investments for Tri-State. A fine company. Nice company to work for. Now, what can I do for you, Mr. Dollar? Oh, it's uh, just the usual routine check in cases of this kind. The general financial status of the Crane Bunch. You mean the Crane Chemical Company or the Crane family? Well, I assume the two went together. No, no, not for several years now. Melba's father sold the last of the family stock a while before his death. Neither Phineas nor Melba have one cent of ownership in the company. I see. Now, the company, of course, is in excellent financial condition. It's the uh, family we're concerned with. Well, there, the picture is a little different. The fact is that although they're the social leaders of the town and everybody figures they're rolling in it, the cranes are broke, flat broke, have been for a couple of years now. But as I understand it, they live at quite a fancy estate out on the edge of town. Sure, and it's mortgaged to the hilt. Hmm. That's very interesting. Of course, uh, lately, old Phineas seems to be going around with a pocket full of money. I don't know where he got it. It is a funny thing. How lately? Since the necklace was stolen? Or before? Oh, long before. Two or three months. Uh, the robbery was only last week. Supposedly, at least. No, I see what you mean, but it's not the answer. Melba wore those pearls to the country club dance just a few days before they were taken. Well, it was an idea. I'll give you a piece of advice, Mr. Dollar. Have more than just an idea before you get too rough with Melba Crane or her uncle. Oh? Yeah, money or no money, they're still top society here. The local aristocrats. And the town kind of takes care of its own. Well, as I said, this is only routine. I don't have the slightest bit of evidence that the Cranes are trying to pull an insurance swindle. But I get paid to be suspicious, that's all. Mm -hmm. Well, I've wondered myself where Phineas was getting the money. Any ideas about it? No, not unless he's been borrowing from his prospective son-in-law. Dean Sellers, the lad who gave Miss Crane the pearls? Yes. How is he fixed financially? 
A man who can afford a $20,000 engagement gift? Yeah, we can assume he's eating regularly, I suppose. Well, actually, I don't know too much about him. He's an out-of-towner, came here about eight months ago. Doesn't bank with me. I see. But I will tell you one thing. If he doesn't have money now, he certainly will have before long. <laughs> he's a go-getter, that boy. Yeah, he must be. Here eight months and engaged to the town bell. Oh, he's a whirlwind. Keeps six or eight projects going all at once. For instance, real estate, business promotion, one thing and another. So busy, he even had to postpone the wedding. They were supposed to get hitched three weeks ago. Of course, I hear that that may be due to, uh, well... Due to what? Mr. Dollar, this whole thing is odd enough just on the basis of facts. The rumors, I think we'll skip. I'm uh, sure you understand. <laughs> That was the second time I was supposed to, quote, understand, unquote. Phineas Crane was sure I could understand about his niece. And banker Milton Borkley was equally certain about the rumors. As a matter of fact, I understood less about the whole thing than I did when I first got in town. I wasn't getting anywhere. I was losing ground. Item three, a dollar forty, two dry martinis in the Green Lion Bar while I waited for Smiley Prell. He was 20 minutes late, but he finally showed up, slipped into the back booth across from me. Are you, uh, your dollar? Right. Have a drink? No, no, some other time. I only got about one minute. All right. What's your price? No price, not now. Oh, look, Smiley, a minute is not long enough to do much bargaining. Well, I didn't come here to bargain. Well, I did. And we assume from the way you talked on the phone to Hartford, you felt the same way. Uh, just uh, keep your shirt on, chum. We'll, we'll make a deal, all right, but uh, later. Not, not right now. Why not? Because something's come up. I gotta get it straightened out first. What? Never mind. Hey, look. You remember this address. Hmm? 1412 North Oak Street, room 6. Huh? The boarding house. Now, you, you meet me there at 9 o'clock tonight. Oh, wait a minute. What's this all about? I haven't got time, chum. Don't worry. You'll get your beads back one way or another. What do you mean? I mean that somebody's trying to hand old Smiley a real quick shuffle. Hmm? First class double cross. And I'm going to see to it that somebody gets it right in the neck. Who? Who's the somebody? Never mind. You just sit tight and meet me at 9 o'clock. And I think I'll be in a position to give you a lot more than just the necklace. You understand? Frankly, no. Well, you will. Uh, you're going to understand real good before you're through. So stick around, hmm, Dollar. <laughs> Johnny Dollar. I guess we were cut off, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, apparently. Now, who did you say you... name's Bartlett, J.D. Bartlett. You mean you work for Mr. Bartlett? I mean, I am Mr. Bartlett. I mean, Miss Bartlett. Oh, now you've got me all confused. You're confused. Look, Mr. Dollar, the only J.D. Bartlett in town is me. I'm him. Of a her, I mean. Now, you see what you've done. I'll never forgive myself. Well, anyway, I'm the tri-state guarantee agent here in Cranesburg, and it seems the least you could have done was to look me up. Well, give me time. I just got in town. You had time to rush out there to that south side bar and start lushing it up. I came out here to this joint to talk to a jewel thief. You what? Jewel thief? It's the guy who phoned Hartford and offered to make a deal on the crane necklace. He claims he's the one who stole it, that for a slight consideration, I can get it back. And what do you think? I think I've walked in on the nuttiest case in the month of Sundays. Hey, look, he's waiting for me at the bar. Suppose I drop by later and... Are you sure J.D. Bartlett is a woman? You're the first man who ever doubted it. I'll see you later, Mr. Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Tri-State Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Cranesburg matter. Expense account continued. When I told her the case was nutty, I meant it. The start of it had been fairly ordinary. A pearl necklace insured for $20,000 had been stolen from a wall safe in the home of its owner, local socialite Melba Crane. Smiley Prell, a known small-time jewel thief, had phoned us, claiming to have the necklace, and Smiley offered to talk a deal. But before I'd been in town ten minutes, things began to crumble and change shape. 
Melba's feather-headed Uncle Phineas had called at my hotel to warn me that his niece was headstrong and impulsive. Or at least he said that was why he'd called. When I tagged the rumor that the aristocratic cranes were flat broke until recently... And now, at the Green Lion Inn, Smiley Prell, a burglar by admission, was turning skittish and climbing up. Look, Dollar, I got no time to talk now. Oh, relax, will you, Smiley? A man in your profession can't afford to develop a case of nerves. Oh, very funny, but I gotta blow this joint. Now, I told you before you went to get that phone call, I got things to do. Yeah, I know what you told me. All right, then. Now, you meet me later at that place in time I told you about it. Sit down. You try pushing me, you're never going to get them beads back. You ever think of that? I don't know where I am anyway. I told you. Sure, and an hour before on the phone, you told me to meet you here and we talk a deal. All right, and so we will. We'll talk later. Hey, what's the matter with you? Dollar, how many times I got to tell you? Something's come up and I got to get it straightened out. Like what, for instance? Like what? Never mind. It's none of your business. It's, It's like personal. So, uh, later, huh? You said you were being handed a double cross. Now, what kind of a double cross? That's exactly what I'm trying to figure out. Who did it? Who crossed you? Never mind who crossed me. It's none of your business. Did you have a partner on this job? Oh, look, now, don't try to kid me. You checked my M.O. before you ever left Hartford. If you did, then you will. You know I always work alone. Well, it can be a first time for anything. Look, I got no time to talk. you have somebody on the inside, Smiley? Hmm? Somebody in the crane house who tipped you off, briefed you? Hmm. <laughs> You, know, you want to know too much. Is that where the double cross came from? Uh, I, I got nothing more to say. More? You haven't said anything yet. Well, you meet me tonight where I said do dollar at nine o'clock. You know something, and... Smiley? I don't think you've got it. Huh? <laughs> what are you talking about? The necklace. I don't think you had anything to do with the robbery. I don't believe you've got it. Or that you've ever even seen it. You don't, huh? No. No, I think you're trying to pull a con of some kind. But it's not going to work. Um, a dollar... You know what the things look like? Yeah, I got photographs of them. All right, then check me out. There are 38 pearls, hmm? Yeah. And they're pink, match color, match size. And they're not pierced like they usually are. Each one's set in a, um, in a fitted platinum mount, and the mounts are fastened together with those, um, you know, those, those little links. What kind of a stone on the clasp? In the clasp? There ain't any stone in the... Hey, what are you trying to do? Okay, okay, all right, you've got it. Or at least you've seen it. So, how much do you want? Meet me tonight at 9 o'clock, and I'll tell you, 1412 North Oak Street, room 6, oh. and no cop. Not if you want them beads back, you understand? Not any more than I did when I walked in here. Well, you will, so just keep your shirt on. Smiley, if you can talk tonight, you can talk now. There's no reason oh, to stall around. Oh, knock it, pal. Now, look, I got things to do and not much time to do them in, so go find yourself a cool pad somewhere and simmer down, huh? So long, Doc. <laughs> Item 4, 275. I was stuck with the check, naturally. So I paid it and strolled toward the door. I stopped just outside in the entranceway to the roadhouse and watched Smiley cross the parking lot toward a tree-shaded taxi stand where a couple of waiting hacks had parked out of the sun. A few yards away from me stood another cab, this one occupied. I stepped out of the entrance and walked over to the taxi because I'd recognized the passenger in the back seat. Afternoon, Mr. Crane. Hey, wait, wait, what? Oh, what? I'm sorry if I startled you. Oh, no, not at all. No, I, I just didn't hear you walk up. Yeah, I, uh, I noticed you seemed pretty concerned with something across the lot. There. Across the lot, but I'm afraid I don't. It understand. wouldn't be that fellow getting into the taxi, would it? But what, what fellow? I don't know what you mean, Mister Dollar. Oh, I could be wrong. I hadn't even noticed the man, as a matter of fact. Oh well, then of course you won't mind if we just stand here and watch him drive off. Fred, I, I really should get back into town. Good. I'm going that way myself. I've got a car here. Be glad to take it. But you. I've already engaged well, this driver. Well, pay him off. We'll get going. Give us a chance to talk on the way in. But, but you might as well, Mr. Crane. The other taxi is already out of sight. Well, I hadn't noticed. Very well. Here you are, driver. Keep the chin. Oh, oh, thank you, sir. My car is over this way. I'm afraid there may be... A misunderstanding of some sort, Mr. Dollar. Oh? You seem to be under the misapprehension that I was interested for some reason in in that stranger who left. I said I could be wrong. And I can assure you that you are. (laughs) Uh, Here's the card. Now, 
To the best of my knowledge, I have never seen the man before in my life. Well, there'll be days like that sometimes. Yeah, what's that? A colloquialism of the common man, Mr. Crane. What, uh, what were you doing out at the Green Lion, by the way, Mr. Crane? Well, I was... Uh, Just uh, uh, killing time, uh, were you? Well, as a matter of fact, sir, I was waiting to talk with you. Well, you don't say. Yes, I was afraid I may have left a wrong impression when I talked with you at your hotel earlier today. In what way, Mr. Crane? But I mean about my niece, Melba. Well, you said she was headstrong, impulsive. Oh, yes, but not a bit more so than any other normal, average girl, Mr. Dollar. Oh, I see. I don't really know why I considered it so important at the time. I... I must have been a little upset. Yeah, well, that's understandable. You don't have a jewel robbery in the family every day. In the family? I mean, uh, stolen from the family. Well, <laughs> Apparently, we're both giving wrong impressions. Well, yes, uh, I'd uh, say. Well, yeah. Reese, I'm glad that everything is cleared up now. I wish it were. Uh, what's that? Nothing has been cleared up yet, as far as I can see. The necklace is still missing. Well, of course, that isn't what I meant. It's what I mean. It's the only reason I'm here in Cranesburg, to recover that necklace one way or another. Well, then what do you mean by one way or another? Either by tagging the thief and getting it back through police action, or if necessary, by making a deal. I just talked to the man who claims to be in possession of the pearls, as you know, of course, but he wasn't. Well, I beg your pardon, sir, but I do not know, of course. Well, then let's say, may have guessed... You were in my hotel room when he phoned. You heard me arrange to meet him here. I didn't really pay much attention to that phone call. All right. Anyway, when I flew in here from Hartford, I expected this to be a cut-and-dried matter of routine. I'd meet Prell, make a quick deal to get the pearls back, and catch the next plane out. Only it's apparently not going to be that way. Yeah, it isn't. What do you mean by that? I mean I've stumbled onto a whole nest full of question marks, and nothing seems to add up quite right. Prell, for one thing... I think he's got himself into a spot of some kind. His attitude doesn't make sense. And what else, Mr. Dollar? Little things. Rumors I've picked up around town. Hints. And, of course, the biggest question mark seems to be right close to home. Which one is that? You, Mr. Crane. When I dropped him off at the center of town, he was still fumbling with vague phrases, trying to clear up the misapprehensions, as he put it, but actually saying nothing. He was sure, however, that I would understand. He was wrong. I didn't. Even my mistake about J.D. Bartlett, Tri-State's local agent, seemed to fit in with the rest of the mixed-up case. I'd assume from the name that Bartlett was a man. But when I walked into the office a few minutes later, I was suddenly happy that I was wrong. Your dollar, I presume? That's right. Miss Bartlett. Just make it J.D. I've spent a lot of time and effort getting those initials pounded into the skulls of the local inhabitants. Why? It's good for business. Makes me one of the boys, you might say. I kind of doubt it somehow. As you mentioned on the phone, you're, uh, unmistakable. <laughs> but that, I'm going to drop the dollar and call you Johnny. Pull up a chair. Yeah. Thanks, J.D. Did you get anywhere with that character who snatched the Queen's rocks? No. Nope. How come? Oh, he stalled. Postponed the whole deal until 9 o'clock tonight. Why? Ah, uh, he was nervous, I guess. Huh? Well, that's about the only reason I can figure. And between him and old Phineas Crane, I'm getting a little nervous myself. How did Phineas get into the act? Good question. Wish I had a good answer. Hey, what about these Cranes, J.D.? What makes them tick? Beats me. Well, you sold them the insurance policy. You must know something about that. I didn't sell the policy. I just permitted it to be bought from me. How so? Melba Crane came snooting into the office one day, dropped the pearls under my plebeian nose, and wanted them insured. Uh oh. Why do you dislike her? She's a good looking dame, and I'm pretty well favored myself. That answer your question? Mm, roughly, yes. So what happened? So I got Jim Markley, local jeweler in here, to appraise him, issued the policy, and that was that. I understand that the necklace was an engagement gift from some newcomer in town. Yeah, Dean Sellers. She had him hooked for he even got his bags unpacked. That skirt has the ethics of a boa constrictor and about as much personality as a face painted on an egg. <laughs> Somehow I don't feel I'm getting an unbiased opinion. You won't at this address. 
Why can't she climb down off her pedestal and play ball with the rest of us? The crane name, the crane tradition, the crane social position. The only thing they're not so high and mighty about is the crane bank account, because there isn't one. Yeah, except lately. As I understand it, old Phineas has been flashing money around pretty freely the last few months. Yeah, so I've heard. Don't ask me to explain it. I can't even explain Phineas. What do you mean? He's a rare one, that old boy. Old school tie, mouthful of mush, that sort of thing. But, you know, if it was a matter of protecting the family name, I actually think he'd commit murder. Johnny Dollar. This is Melba Crane, Mr. Oh, yes, Miss Crane. I phoned a little while ago, and your maid said you were out. She told me. Was there something you... You've had a $20,000 pearl necklace stolen. I thought you might want to talk about it. I have talked about it. The local police were quite thorough, Mr. Dollar. Well, let's say there have been some new developments. Like what? That's what I want to see you about. I suppose you want to come out here. Oh, thank you. Will a half hour from now be convenient? Couldn't we talk about this over the phone? If 45 minutes will be better for you, I'll be glad to cooperate. You seem to be a very persistent man. I usually get what I go after. Know something, Mr. Dollar? What? So do I. Oh, then this might turn out to be interesting. See you in a half hour. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Cranesburg, Ohio. To the Home Office Tri-State Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cranesburg matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item, $20,000. The face value of the policy on a pearl necklace stolen one week ago from Miss Melba Crane. Young socialite, one of the last two surviving members of the town's most aristocratic family. And, according to her own statement, a girl who always got what she went after. Well, I'd almost got what I'd gone after. I'd at least made contact with Smiley Prell, the jewel thief who'd phoned Hartford and offered a deal. But that was all. Smiley had clammed up, started to stall, and implied the whole thing was blowing up at his face. And now, the victim herself was trying to stall. And on top of everything else, a storm was coming up. I left my hired car near the coach house and walked down a long arbor toward the entrance to the Crane Mansion. It had been quite an estate once, still was, but the buildings needed a touch of paint here and there, and the gardens needed a gardener, just a hint of wear and tear. It fit with what I'd learned at the bank. Though still tops in local society, Melba Crane and her Uncle Phineas were flat broke. I was reaching to ring the doorbell when I saw the couple in the sunroom. A man in a business suit and a girl in a maid's uniform. So busy with each other, they didn't even notice me at first. It was an intensely romantic scene, and I started to feel like a peeping Tom. The girl was still a little red-faced when she answered the door a few seconds later. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Johnny Dollar. I'd like to see Miss... Dollar! You're the investigator about the robbery. Lauder must have wired everybody in town. Oh, I... I'm sorry, sir. I, I didn't mean to blurt it out that oh, way. Oh, I found it interesting. You know we're going to get a little wet if that rain starts? Oh, uh, won't you come in, Mr. Dollar? Thanks. You'll uh, want to see Miss Crane, I imagine. Yes, I think she's expecting me. If you'll wait here, please. Oh, by the way, I uh, I didn't interrupt you, I hope. Interrupt? I, I'll tell her you're here, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. Bye, honey. See you later. Oh, hello. You must be the insurance fellow. Did you get a wire, too? A wire? Oh, no. Melba told me you were coming out. I'm a friend of the family, Mr. Dollar, Dean Sellers. How are you, Mr. Sellers? Melba and I are engaged, you know. Congratulations. Oh, it's not recent. Yeah, I know. So you're a little hard to figure out. I'm a complete enigma, Mr. Sellers. I believe you're the chap who gave Miss Crane the necklace, right? Yes, it was an engagement present. Do you uh, have any lead on it yet? Nothing definite. I understood you'd been contacted by the thief who stole it. That's right. 
Well, then you... Well, I haven't have... actually seen the necklace yet, and until I do, I can't be positive this man ever, well, even has it. It wouldn't be the first time a professional jewel thief has tried to pull a swindle. I see. Uh, tell me something, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Suppose you do get hold of the pearls. What happens to them then? Well, that depends. If Miss Crane's claim hasn't been paid at the time, they go to her. If it has been paid and she refuses to reopen negotiations, then we sell the necklace to recover our losses. And up till now, as I understand it, the claim hasn't been paid. That's right. I see. Well, I hope you get it back quick, then. The insurance won't cover the sentimental value. Sentimental value to whom, Mr. Sowers? <laughs> to both of us. Oh, I know. I, uh, I saw you outside the sunroom there. Strictly unintentional. Uh, what I mean is his appearances can be deceiving sometimes. I... I wouldn't want you to misunderstand. Oh, I think I understand perfectly, Mr. Sellers. Good. Whether Miss Crane would or not may be something else again. Though. Oh, Melba's very understanding. She must be. Well, I've got to run on. She'll be down in a minute. Uh, my office is in the Ridley building. Drop in if there's any way I can help. Thanks. I may just do that. Hello? I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Dollar. Oh, that's all right. It, it gave me a chance to meet your fiancé. Oh, were you talking with Dean? We exchanged a few pleasantries. Isn't he a darling? Well... Of course, he's a little headstrong sometimes, and impulsive. But he, but never, he never means any harm by it. How did you know? Oh, personal observation. And also, by an odd coincidence, that's exactly the way you were described to me. Oh? Instead of beautiful, glamorous, seductive? I imagine it was assumed that I could see those qualities for myself. Hmm. I wonder if I should buy that as it is or analyze it first. I warn you, I'm dangerously subtle. I think you may be at that. Would you like a drink, or are you one of those always stick to business types? I'm even worse. I combine the two. I'll have scotch on the rocks. Well, that's my drink. Well, now we found something in common. We already had something the robbery. Yeah, you want to talk about it? Why not? I want that necklace recovered as much as you do. Yes, I understand it has a high sentimental value. Who told you that? Your fiancé. Oh. Here's your drink. Thanks. To pearls, the frozen tears from the eyes of Allah. A poetic cop. <laughs> More cynical than poetic. The man I heard call them that had just knifed a British colonial administrator and blown up a sampan with six Chinese fishermen aboard. Why? Nine pearls. He wanted them. There were 38 in that necklace of yours. This man, did he get away with it? Uh, not exactly. He was shot to death on the Hong Kong waterfront. Now, this is good scotch. It is? Another thing, Miss Crane, I am not a cop, poetic or otherwise. It amounts to the same thing, doesn't it? Well, in some ways. I'm not professionally concerned with identifying and capturing criminals and bringing them to justice. My obligations on that score are no more nor less than those of any other private citizen. So? So I'm hired by the insurance company to protect their interests. Usually that involves trying to recover stolen property or looking for evidence of insurance fraud. I'm afraid I don't quite... Sometimes I make deals, Miss Crane. Meaning exactly what? Meaning that if somebody should start something and get in over their head, I, I might listen to reason, try to work something out. A cop wouldn't. He's not permitted to. Well, that would all be very interesting, I'm sure, to the person who stole the necklace. Yeah, you'd think so, wouldn't you? What about that person, Mr. Dollar, the jewel thief who phoned the insurance company? Smiley Prell. I talked to him a couple of hours ago, briefly. Does he have the pearls? I don't know. Uh, do you mind if I have another drink? Go ahead. Thanks. What do you mean you don't know? That's why you came here, wasn't it? To meet him and get them back? He may not have them. He may just be trying to swindle the insurance company. That's not too uncommon a game, you know. No, I wouldn't, know. Oh, yeah. It's tried every now and then. The nicest people sometimes. Just looking at you. you know, it seems to me you're taking this whole thing pretty calmly. <sighs> well, that's merely a front. Inside, I'm a seething volcano. Now, look... Hey, tell me something. Why did you postpone your wedding? I didn't. Dean was the one who... Now, what difference does it make? What's that got to do with it? Do you think he's changed his mind about marrying you? 
Suppose we leave Mr. Sellers out of it. Can't. He's already in it. He's the one who gave you the necklace in the first place, an engagement gift. Has he called off the engagement, Miss Crane? He hasn't, and he won't, regardless of any rumors you may hear to the contrary. Now, does that answer your question? Mm, more or less. Then suppose we leave my personal life alone and talk about the robbery. That is, if you're at all interested in it. Where is the safe, Miss Crane? Safe? Oh, that the necklace was in. It's there behind that painting. Do you want to see it? If you don't mind. All right. You and your uncle live here alone, as I understand it. My maid, of course, Betty. Well, there's the safe. I doubt if you'll find any fingerprints or anything. The police spent hours on it. Mm-hmm. That's a real old-fashioned one. Our family's been around quite a while, Mr. Dollar. Wouldn't be much of a job for a professional safecracker. You mean even without the combination? Even without. How did the thief get into the house? Force a window somewhere, a door? No, with a key, I guess. Oh? You see, it happened in the afternoon. I'd gone out, and Uncle Phineas was out somewhere, as usual. The house was empty at the time. What about your maid? Betty? Well, after I left, she decided to go into town to do some shopping or something. Oh, they couldn't possibly have picked a better time. Apparently not. Would you like to look around the house? No, no thanks. I've got a pretty complete story from the police reports. Mostly I came out here to take a look at you. And what's your verdict? Maybe I'll do better with Smiley Prowl. I'm meeting him later. Oh? And is he going to produce the necklace? I don't know. He talked about a double cross. Said he might give me more than I was bargaining for. He was pretty upset. Why? I don't know. Oh, incidentally, Mr. Dollar, there's someone else you'll no doubt be talking to, and I want to warn you about him. Who's that? Uncle Phineas. Of course he means all right, Is but... he headstrong and impulsive, too? He makes up things sometimes, and he's, well, just a little bit vague. Balmy, you mean? Mr. Dollar, with people of our class, it's referred to as eccentric. I'm sure you understand. I left the house filled with understanding and with some brand new questions about the cranes that needed still more understanding. The lowering storm clouds had brought an early dusk and it was nearly dark when I reached to open the door of my car. Then suddenly I caught a flash of white at the corner of the coach house. Somebody had seen me and tried to duck out of sight. I walked quickly across the driveway and moved quietly up to the corner of the building. How are you, Betty? Mr. Dollar. Can I help you with that? Uh, no. I mean, I, I, I was just going to burn some trash. Well, let me put it in the incinerator for you. Here. No, please. Sure you sorted these papers? There seems to be something heavy here. Betty? Uh, let me have it, please. You won't understand. Why, Miss Crane thought I was very understanding. Betty! Uh, you'd better run on. She sounds impatient. I'll, I'll take care of this. Please. No, please. You'll only... Oh! I watched her disappear into the shadows, running toward the house. Then I unwrapped the package she'd been trying to hide in the incinerator it was a 32 caliber revolver, and one chamber had been fired recently. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a strange disappearance, a grim cry in the night. And a quarry is run to earth in room 313. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
Welcome back. So far, this is a relatively slow-moving story. It feels like the sixth part uh, is being used to pad things out. Uh, it's worth noting, even though thanks to us playing three episodes at once, you didn't hear it, the actual ending of a couple episodes were altered intentionally or unintentionally to create the illusion that there might be a seventh episode of this story. Uh, it's also worth noting that in 2020, there was an AFRS version of the serial uncovered. Now, while the domestic version of the story was going to be six parts, the AFRS schedule allowed no such deviation. So what they actually did is cut episode two. While the discovery of the maid with the gun at the end of that part was important, the entire second episode takes a while, and I do wonder whether the serial would be better without it. When I do the omnibus version of the story, I wonder whether we should try the AFRS version or the network version of the serial. Probably my favorite part of the story so far was JD. I really appreciate how unimpressed she is with the cranes and her overall sassy attitude. Again, it really was the highlight of these first few episodes. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback and... We start out with a comment regarding the older matter from Rosala, who writes on Facebook, despite your strong American accent, and then she has a emoji of two pink gloves clapping. Well, thank you so much, I, I think. Now some comments on the Nick Shern matter. And from YouTube, uh, Roncha writes... Adam, I agree with everything you said about this serial, but you missed one of the greatest features. Barney Phillips made a great sidewalk Santa. I imagine he and Bob Bailey had a ball doing that scene. Well, thanks so much for the comment, Ryan, sir. There is so much good to say about the Nick Shern matter. It's hard to cover it all. Plus, I tend to be a bit light on my commentary on the first half of the serial. But I think Barty Phillips as a sidewalk Santa really was a nice highlight. Much like uh, Ken Christie playing Mike O'Dare, Barney Phillips as the sidewalk Santa is really different from the typical roles we hear him in, particularly in these Johnny Dollar serials. And I think the one other thing I forgot to mention, uh, now that you mention it, it was Virginia Gregg, who played the landlady in episode two, and then played Kathy O'Dare in episodes four and five. It really is remarkable just the high quality of her output and how she's really able to seamlessly play two characters like that. And then I received another comment. I've made this comment before. This is my favorite radio episode. The exposition is perfect and the scenes are so descriptive that I can easily visualize what's going on. And Mary says... Marvelous, simply marvelous. And then we have a comment regarding the long shot matter. This one comes via Spotify. Susan writes, love Johnny Dollar, thank you. And then we have a brand new review in the Apple Podcast Store. And DMB writes, love Johnny Dollar. Started listening to him with my mom on car rides. Takes me back to an era long ago and at a time in America when things were simple and wholesome. Well, thank you so much for the review. Now, I know there are some people who might hear a review like that and say, well, things back then were not uh, that simple and that wholesome, and then, you know, point out that various things were going on. And, and I think that there is a point in that, that there were some serious issues in the past and some stuff that really needs acknowledged. But I also feel that there was an attempt, an effort at being wholesome that a lot of people tried to practice that we've kind of just given up on even trying. And I'm of the mind that because ideals weren't lived out perfectly, 
is not a good reason to give up on the ideals totally. But at any rate, thank you so much. Appreciate you taking the time to leave a review in the Apple Podcast Store. It really means so much to us here. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Bailey. Bailey has been one of our Patreon supporters since April, currently supporting the podcast at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Bailey. And that will actually do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software and be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you download it from. We will be back on Friday with the conclusion of the Cranesburg matter, but join us back here tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... Well, now, dearie, that's going to take a bit of thinking, I'm afraid. You don't keep a record of your borders, Mrs. Farland. Never bother to. Uh, might I offer you a little nip of something? I always have a small glass before supper. It helps the appetite, you know. Thanks, but I'll skip this round if you don't mind. It also takes the chill out of one's bones. Nasty weather out, ain't it, did it? So it is. Now, about this advertisement, Mrs. Farland, it appeared in the Dover Times on April 29th, 1945. Well, I don't seem to recall it at the moment, but if you say so... Here's I... a copy of the paper. Oh, yes, yeah, so I see, so I see. 1945. Hey, we'd had it proper, if you know what I mean. 41 was a nasty year it was. Dreadful. Them Nazi bombers over there day and night. I'm trying to locate a man who might have answered this ad, Mrs. Farland. That was more than seven years ago, did he? I know. I... I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.